Okay, folks, so I think what we're going to do for a moment is talk about what is tuning. I mean, we're, we're sitting here looking at what the car makes. I mean, regardless of what tune is in the car, it's making this power. So it doesn't matter if I touched it, if someone else touched it, if it's on a carburetor, if it's on a distributor, uh, you know, or, or EFI. So what I want to talk about for a moment is what actual calibration is and before calibration, what is tuning on a more basic level. So tuning... Yeah, yeah so let, let's say a car comes in, put it on the dyno, and you get your baseline. Like, here, here's the starting point. Sure. And now you are going to start, like, looking at all of that data and start making changes. So what, what are you actually doing when you're starting to look at where, where you're going to apply a change? I think the first thing that we're going to look at when before any of that and, and with the baseline in mind, we've already done our baseline, we're going to look at the data and see if it's realistic. Um, not just the data on the dyno sheet, but the data that we recorded in the computer. Does it really make sense that the car thinks that the target is 12 to 1 but we're running 9 to 1 air fuel ratio? We want them to match. We want that data to be concise. So I think the first step in tuning is always going to be setting up sensors so that they give the computer realistic data. We can certainly fudge tune and make it, make it tell it 9 to 1 and see 11 to 1 there. Uh, if that's our target is 11 to 1, we can, we can tell it to do things to make it 11 to 1 in reality and the computer has no idea. Um, but what we want to do is actually calibrate sensors, things like mass airflow sensors, um, oxygen sensors, NOx sensors. We want all those things to, to be able to look at that data and say, hey, that's obviously a real knock. We don't right. want to run that much ignition time here. Let's try to do a different strategy to keep the engine safe. So, so the ECU that's running the engine, there's all these sensors on the engine that are bringing in telemetry and you're looking at that once you do your baseline pull on the dyno. You're, you're, that's, yeah. that's your starting point. And so, you know, if there's something that's out of spec, like, hey, you know, the air-fuel ratio, it, it's not hitting what it's supposed to be or the timing is, it's, there's way too much or, or not, not nearly yeah. enough. Or, well, really what I'm saying is we want the computer, if, it's, if I'm saying, let's give it 15 degrees before top dead center, if we put a timing light on that car, we don't want to see it at 10 degrees before top dead center. Right. So the initial function of a tuner is to make sure all that data is coming in correctly. When you change the intake in your car, that's the big one, uh, with, especially with mass airflow based yeah. engines, we're going to see way bad data. Um, that data could be massaged uh, to make the car run well without giving us good information. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So what, what we mean by math scaling, because I mean that, that kind of can be That's a big word. Yeah. Well, and it could be extrapolated to how you tune other sensors if, if there's a different parameter. So, like with sure. a mass airflow sensor, there is a like it's usually a zero to five volt, and yeah. so so the range of air that can come across is it will it will give out a signal of zero to five volts. But if you put on an intake that maybe has a larger diameter, yeah, uh, than, than what the what we'll the generally is. see lower voltage. Right. So if so, it's not calibrated, so it's you're, you're getting a voltage still. Like there's still a value coming off, but it's not. It doesn't actually mean what it meant when it was the stock air box. Yeah, you're you're getting maybe say two and a half volts, but where it was originally it was like this amount of air. Now it's actually that amount of air plus twenty percent or something. Sure. Like yeah. That. Yeah. And then usually you know it'll it'll get caught in what's called closed loop operation by uh, feedback from the oxygen sensor. But we want to be sure if we're using. Uh, a non-standard oxygen sensor like a wideband that that's calibrated so we're not getting bad feedback. We want to be sure that when we see 14.7 to 1 as a, as a reading that it really means that. So th right. that's the first step is to just get the sensors reading correctly. Once all the sensors are reading correctly, not only can the car calculate realistic data for us, that, which may be not the most important thing, it, it, it is in the sense that uh, as a calibrator you can say, hey, I want to add five degrees, but in the past running 25 degrees on this engine is, is getting close to, to damaging pistons. So it, by having good data and having the, the sensors read correctly, we can start to make better and better decisions preemptively uh, using not just the dyno sheet, but our data logs as right. well. So, so what you're basically saying is when you want to use that as a baseline so that whatever changes you make, like if, if I want to add 10% to an injector duty cycle, you're really adding just 10%. Yeah. And by the same token, if that 10% gives you a change in air-fuel ratio, the change that you're seeing is what you're actually getting, not just a number that is that is skewed because the calibration is off. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's also nice to be able to say like, hey, my target table is saying 11 and I'm getting 11. Why don't I just change my target table to 12 and I'll get 12? 
right. and, ex and you can expect it when everything's set up correctly. So tuning is really not just uh, the calibration end of it, but it's actually get, making the computer ready to see that data right. initially and make those decisions correctly. And so once you start making changes, you know, we've talked already about you know, how, how much information you can actually get from a dyno chart or, or in real time as you were doing a poll on the dyno. So one of the feedback that you get, again, when you start applying change to how the engine is running, is you can actually see the difference and make sure that you're going in the direction you want to go, be it as far as fueling, um, air fuel ratio, power, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And those are, those are changes, definitely. Once we get past the initial setup of sensors, we start making those decisions to try to bump these numbers up and to get more and more power. And still, we're watching other sensors to make sure it's happening safely the whole time. We don't want it to be an unsafe number that we just got this great big peak. So what we're doing is we're, we're doing things like leaning out, adding timing, but it's certainly no sin to pull timing out to see if it makes a change. If you, sure. if you arrive at the dyno, you know, I think experience shows this. People just want to push forward. They just want more and more power. My first step is usually to go in a safe direction and say, hey, look, I pulled out three degrees and I didn't lose a bit of horsepower. So why would I start there and add timing in if it's going to create danger for the engine? Uh, so you can actually be adding timing and getting closer to a ragged edge where damage would happen, but you're not actually gaining anything for it. Yeah, so nothing other than damage. <laughs> to be safer to actually back it off. Yeah. You know, boost pressure is another one of those. We've talked about it before, but there's not a linear relation between boost pressure and power. No. It's, it's more of a bell curve. There will be a point where you keep adding boost pressure, but you actually stop making power and you can actually start losing power. Yeah. And so if you go over that curve, you're actually the intake is much, much hotter. There's much more chance for detonation, pre-ignition, what have you. Yeah, and the truth is you're moving less mass of air. Yeah. You're actually ingesting less air, which, as we know, that's the goal. More so you're not air. actually gaining anything from doing it other than getting closer to the ragged edge where if something goes wrong, a sensor fails, something like that, damage would occur, whereas if you if you back it off and have more of a safe approach, then it, then it would not. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. so one, of the, one of the things that, um, I mean, we're talking about tuning an ECU, but Modern ECUs are pretty smart, right? So yeah. That, so when when a when you're just driving down the road, there there's various parameters that the ECU is looking at, but it is always looking at the data that's coming in, right? So sure. It, does the ECU kind of tune itself within a limited extent? It does. As you're driving. Yeah, yeah, it does. But I'll say, you know, the, the the ideal goal is that it doesn't need to. The ideal goal is we remove as many of those sensors as we can and it still runs perfectly fine. Those sensors are really, uh, on a good tune, I'd say, used more as a safety net than as something that actually helps further calibrate the car once you get it off the dyno. We want to see our optimal calibration on the dyno and then start to back off uh, when the sensors encounter negatives. Right. You know, I think that's really the goal. So, you know, because especially with Subarus and intakes, just like we talked about masterful sensor and scaling. Yeah. You know, so when, when you put something on, the ECU will know that something is different, right? And, and it'll try, or it, it'll probably know that something is different because other input down the line is not matching yeah. what the master flow sensor is saying. Yeah, it sees definitely a skewed data at that point. And it will try and adapt with whatever range it can. Now, I mean, typically sure. there's a range that, that the ECU can modify the sensor input or, or compensate. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty limited. It is limited. It's, it's yeah. definitely more limited than what you can do, per se. Oh, yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah, so we try to get it in the center of that bandwidth and then right. allow those corrections to occur, occur plus or minus. And even if a car has, say, 25% fuel correction available right. to it, we want to keep it under 5 or 10% just to make sure it's, it's happy. You can never really get a car that's going to be perfect, um, in my experience, but you can get pretty close. So. Sure. Yeah, that's our goal. But it's way better if you are actually in there verifying that the data that you're looking at is correct, and then you start making changes to make sure that it is now precise and correct, versus trying to let the ECU, like, Figure, figure it out. out. So, yeah, that's dangerous. And I'll say, I'll say, there's a, like, there's a thing where, uh, in general, if I'm going to make a fuel trim, I'm going to want it to be negative, a few percentage points. And that way, if the the customer, if their oxygen sensor fails going down the road, the car will not only drive exactly the same; it'll be just like a little bit rich. And we call that fail safe. So if the right. part fails, it's on the safe side. Right. 
Right. Uh, whereas if you're just throwing a, a map, an e-tune at it that's just kind of, oh, this is good for 90% of the other cars. Well, say you have a, a fuel pressure regulator that's five pounds light and it's just out of manufacturing, you're going to have a car that's running lean going down the road instead right. and having to correct positively. The day that that car's oxygen sensor fails, it goes a lot leaner and, and potentially melts Bad distance. Yeah. 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 So what you're kind of doing is, is a calibrator, recalibrating the ECU, is you're, you're basically resetting the baseline. You know, if, if a change has been made to the car, you're resetting the baseline so that that is now correct for whatever changes have been made. So if the ECU is going to try and like look at all the sensor data that comes in and make whatever corrections it can, it now has the proper baseline to judge that versus oh, yeah. not and, and maybe having to try and adjust towards the maximum of its, of its range or possibly even beyond that. Yeah, which I mean, that's just that's yeah. And rather than relying on all these sensors, like ten sensors, to make sure the thing is coming together in a good way, eventually, yeah. after it learns for a while and it's damaging itself while it's learning, we want it to be uh, running on the fewest number of sensors or with the few littlest, smallest influence of all those corrective sensors. You know, oxygen sensors, knock sensors. We don't want those things to be very active. We almost want to be able to turn all those off and have the customer not even notice. Uh, we want to be able to disconnect the battery and reconnect it and have the car drive away in a perfectly happy state on the safe side and maybe learn like, hey, I can pull out two or three percent fuel and hey, I can give it a, a degree or two of timing right. instead of say, every time I disconnect the battery, have it detonate for a couple blocks and then learn its right. way out of the, the damaging detonation, you know? Sure. Well, and maybe, can you speak more to that as far as, you, you alluded to it earlier, but when you're, when you're tuning a car, when you're starting to make changes, you have the ability to make changes to reach a maximum number per se, but you can also pull back and actually make changes from the standpoint of, of safety and, and like I said, a fail safe standpoint. Certainly, yeah. And, and with the dyno, obviously it's a tool so you can measure the impact of that, in, in, but maybe if you leave two horsepower on the table, but you're running three degrees less timing, the margin of safety is much higher in that circumstance than if you had pushed that extra time. Sure, yeah, yeah. There, and there is a point with, especially with like low octane fuels, which I consider 91 or 93 even to be low octane in this day and age. Um, we, we, there's different types of engines. There's, I'll say there's uh, three situations. One's uh, two are knock limited and one is unlimited by knock. In one situation, uh, we, we start to encounter abnormal combustion, which we call knock, which will damage pistons um, much earlier before we reach that peak power. So we really need the dyno to tell us, hey, um, or, hey it's, it's starting to get dangerous, um, right. let's back off. The second situation, which I usually see with like typical Subarus where we have eight to one compression and we're running a reasonable amount of boost, like 15 pounds on 91, is it's not, not knock limited, but it's very close to that. We actually can make peak power just before it starts to knock. That's typically the approach you'll see on street tuning where they get it to knock and they pull out a few degrees and they're like, that's your best power. Um, on a knock limited engine like the new FA engine, that's a, that's a, I'll say that's an approach you can use as well, but with things like uh, E85 or 110 octane gasoline, it's never going to knock almost. You right. can go 10 degrees past peak power. So using the knock sensor as a tuning tool is not only going to damage your engine, but by using the dyno, we can actually see when it stops producing power in those situations with high octane or even with 91 and low compression. It's only, you can only really use the knock sensor in the street in, in a knock, a knock limited situation. Because the dyno is, it's a controlled environment. Yeah. But I know that at one point you were telling me that um, it's kind of a worst case scenario in some ways. You sure. Know? So if you, you know, uh, if you, you put a car in third gear and do a full throttle pull, go up to red line, you might be going 85, 90 miles an hour. But, yeah. But in front of the car, you don't have a fan that's actually moving 90 miles an hour of wind. No, I don't. <laughs> so, I mean, you've got a fan, but it's not, it's not exactly the same as if you're driving it on the street. But there, you can actually use that to your advantage, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can uh, thermally load the cars a little bit more. There are days that are so cold in here that I have to turn the fans off to get the yeah. cars to behave realistically as, as though they were on the road. We certainly want to take it out and compare it once we're done, but I'll say, in general, you're going to see a, a more heat, less thermal um, uh, shedding of, of energy when you're on a dyno than when you're traveling through the air mass uh, of right. the street. Um, so what that means is it's worse than reality um, and we, we will see knock earlier in those situations. The good news is we can do things like run extra fans, we can speed it up if we wanted to do that. It's certainly, um, we can provide situations that you could never see on the road. I can take a car to redline 
and reverse pull down do from red line to zero RPMs at wide open throttle. Mm -hmm. You would never see that situation on the road unless you, I don't know how you would. Right, um, let's, let's but, hope you never would. Yeah, unless you're towing like a big rig trailer, right. or, right. you know, something like that. So we can make up these situations that are, that are so heavy duty that we know the car is safe and then when you put it on the road, you know it's really safe because right. it's much easier. Because you're, you're tuning, you can tune the car for a condition that you probably only, you would only see in its worst day. Oh yeah. And if it makes power and is reliable there, then when you actually get out onto the road, you know because you're never going to be as bad as that and have that kind of thermal loading that, again, it's, it's more of that fail safe. Sure, yeah. And if that's something that the tuner can do, you can do as the calibrator, but, you know, again, back to, like, if, if the ECU is dynamic and trying to make changes, it's never going to be able to do anything close to that. No, no, it wouldn't, yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, I've, I've, when I was younger and, and started tuning, people would say, hey, you should let it sweep faster, and I tried that, and yet it worked fine on flat ground, but when I would point some of these cars up in the hills, um, they would start to knock. So I found that I needed to replicate the worst hill that I can find. We live here near Denver, uh, where there's some pretty there's bad hills. hills yeah. So I make typical pulls take 15 seconds. So going through one gear in 15 seconds, compare that to the typical quarter mile run of one of these cars of 12 seconds for four gears or five gears even. Um, it's definitely worse than the real situation on the road. And uh, sure. I'm sort of proud of that. I think it's a uh, it's testament to the durability of these cars and the tunes that we put in them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, Harvey, thanks very much for your time. Sure. Uh, thanks for enlightening us all. Uh, if this, you found this video helpful, please drop a like and uh, stay tuned for more Flatiron Studio Tech Talk. Thank you.